Hello everyone, you're watching Let's Talk About Prepping. I'm Tyler, your host, and in this video I want to talk about a threat which, if something isn't done about it, I see as nearly inevitable, and which will definitely cause the end of the world as we know it. In this case, when I say the end of the world as we know it, I mean the end of our modern technology. Failures in systems like overseas communication, trade, the internet, and distribution. In prepping communities, when we talk about this kind of systemic failure, it's often in relation to dramatic events like EMPs, but this situation is one which is ignored for a while until it suddenly becomes a huge problem, and we may be somewhere in the middle of that process right now. This particular situation is one which is caused by the loss of our telecommunications networks through the loss of our satellites. Satellites share the load of the telecommunications network, and without them we will experience rippling data delays and thereby crashes in other systems, and this will cause failures in commerce, distribution, and civil services. And this could very easily trigger the kind of full systemic collapse that we often discuss in prepping communities. In today's video, we're going to talk about Kessler Syndrome, a topic which will confuse your medical buddies and prove to your aerospace friends that prepping is rocket science, or at least it can involve rocket science. So before we get started, let's make sure we're all on the same page with our basic orbital mechanics. It's something that's very easy to get confused about. Sometimes Hollywood portrays space as a neighborhood as a place that is somewhat fixed around Earth and where you can go with your spaceship to visit all the various space stations that are parked there, and it doesn't portray these as things that are always relative and moving, but this is not the case at all with real orbit. In reality, anything in orbit near Earth is moving so fast that it can only be said to be holding still in relation to something else going the same speed in the same direction. Anything near the Earth experiences so much gravity that it's impossible to actually stay still near the Earth and not fall back towards it. If you send a rocket away from the Earth, it will simply fall back as soon as you stop creating thrust to push against Earth's gravity. That's because gravity only decreases gradually with distance. There's no point at which gravity suddenly decreases as is portrayed in movies, and this is something that I misunderstood well into my adult life. Rather than gravity suddenly ceasing right about where humans want to orbit Earth, it is actually quite strong until well out past geostationary orbit, which is where something must travel to stay over the exact same spot on Earth. Anything closer to Earth has to move quite fast in order to avoid falling into the gravity well. A real nice way to start thinking about orbit is through a thought experiment posed by Sir Isaac Newton himself. If one fires a cannonball along the face of the Earth, gravity pulls it down. If one fires that cannonball again using more power, that cannonball travels further along the face of the Earth before it lands. If one were able to fire that cannonball with enough gunpowder or to make it accelerate on its own, it could continue to essentially fall sideways across the face of the Earth without ever touching the ground. And if that cannon was fired far above the Earth, say 100 miles above the Earth, it would have a significant advantage in achieving orbit, and this is essentially what we do to get objects into space. Except, instead of using cannons, we use rockets, and instead of launching them from sea level, we fly them high up until they're above most of the atmosphere, where all of that atmospheric drag can affect them. And then, the rocket executes a roll program and points sideways, then begins to accelerate to achieve orbital velocity. Except the entire rocket can't reach orbital velocity. It's far too heavy. Parts must be jettisoned as they are emptied of fuel. This is the only way to escape the tyranny of the rocket equation. The equation which dictates how much weight can be flown off of the planet given a certain type of fuel and that fuel's efficiency. And this is where our problem begins. Almost every rocket that flies into space drops something in order to achieve orbit, and while some of these earlier stages may fall right back to Earth, many do not, and are instead left in space to achieve their own form of orbit. Considering that only 1 in 10 satellites are still functional, the lower stages of a rocket are hardly the only concern we have. Indeed, the larger well-known objects with well-tracked trajectories, like early rocket stages, are among the least of our concerns. 
It's been about 60 years that mankind has been putting things into space, and a disturbing number of items have accumulated out there. Between spent rocket stages, inert satellites, actual nuts and bolts, and even debris from exploded satellites, Earth orbit is becoming a dangerous place. There are 750,000 known objects in orbit around Earth in only the range of 1 to 10 centimeters, that's 0.4 inches to 4 inches, with around 19,000 objects being tracked that are over 10 centimeters or 4 inches in size. Only two to 400 of these objects fall to Earth each year, and meanwhile there are many, many smaller pieces as well. It is estimated that there are over 150 million pieces of debris smaller than a centimeter or four-tenths of an inch in orbit around Earth, and while this may sound quite small, it's important to remember that these objects are moving faster than a speeding bullet, ten times faster, in fact. Objects in orbit are going faster than 17,000 miles per hour, or about Mach 23. For reference, even the fastest planes fall apart around Mach 7 in the atmosphere. Being hit by an object going 17,000 miles per hour is going to hurt, especially if you're also going that fast in the opposite direction. At these speeds, even something minuscule can have immense energy to share. This has been evidenced by the cracks formed in the glass of the ISS and Space Shuttle when they were hit by things as small as a piece of paint just one millimeter in size. Because an object's energy increases as the square of its velocity, the bullet from an AR-15 would have a hundred times the energy compared to its normal speed. This is the difference between 1,300 foot-pounds of force and 130,000 foot-pounds of force. What this tells us is that there are essentially millions of speeding bullets whizzing around in space, some the size of a family vehicle, spinning out their time and waiting to collide with something and make countless more bits of debris. And most objects will have plenty of time to wait. Another thing that Hollywood often portrays wrongly is how difficult it actually is to fall toward Earth once you do achieve orbit. Because there is almost no air friction in space, it takes a long time for an object to slow down enough for its orbit to become lower. For instance, the International Space Station does experience a small amount of atmospheric drag at its orbit of roughly 254 miles above the Earth, enough for it to lose roughly 2 meters per second of speed per month. For an example of this, I like to imagine all the helium from the balloons we pop and from all the industrial purging just floating up away from Earth and bumping into the ISS on its way out to ride the solar wind away from our planet forever. As an interesting side note, there is also a helium apocalypse coming because helium is one of the true fossil fuels only being created inside of stars or from radioactive decay in stone, and for this reason, the Earth will eventually run out of helium for all the things we use it for. But back to the ISS. It has to counteract this atmospheric drag by getting a boost from visiting space capsules before they depart for Earth. Even so, it would take years for the ISS to fall if left to its own devices, and it would almost certainly experience even more collisions in that period of time than it already has and the same holds true for anything else up there. If nothing is done to begin removing debris from orbit, that debris can be expected to continue to collide and produce more individual fragments, eventually populating Earth's orbit with so much deadly trash that nothing can safely orbit there or perhaps even escape from Earth at all. Although the locked-in syndrome is far less likely than simple orbital denial. Speaking of orbital denial, that is the name for weapons which are designed to destroy satellites and create this disaster scenario intentionally. It's the kind of thing a military might do if their nation were crippled by an EMP attack, for instance. All major nations are suspected or known to have killsat weapons, much like the one tested by China in 2007, creating thousands of pieces of debris. It's not known for certain if or when we can expect to see these events start to accelerate but many of those concerned see this threat as very real and nearly inevitable. While some space agencies are looking to reduce and resolve the problem, the cost involved in cleaning up space or even just avoiding clutter will always be the limiting factor until the problem becomes too expensive to ignore. Humanity can only hope that those expenses come in the form of money and not societal progress or human lives. So thanks for sticking around with this dive into a topic that I rarely hear discussed anywhere, even in prepping or space circles alike. Now, for a fun little bonus fact, 
some people, including myself, suspect that the first man-made object to truly enter space may have been the one-ton manhole cover from the first nuclear test chamber. The detonation was much larger than expected, and a high-speed camera trained on the shaft exit registered only one frame with the manhole cover moving through the air, giving scientists an estimated speed of 70 kilometers per second. That's six times the escape velocity for Earth. Now, it's almost certain that all 2,000 pounds of steel were vaporized in the air and fell back to Earth as molecules. And it's important to note that the man who designed the steel cap and who gave the speed estimate doesn't think that it escaped the planet. But I personally really like to believe that the first man-made object to truly exit the atmosphere was a chunk of steel fired like a bullet by an underground nuclear test. That sounds like something I would do if I was running that test. Alright, well thanks for watching guys, and I hope that that was interesting. Share some of your thoughts in the comments down below. And please, stay tuned with Let's Talk About Prepping for future videos. Stay safe out there everyone.